growth, success of an entrepreneur. We raise the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Road Truth listeners. Today I have Trevor Williams. He is the inventor of the Williams Key. Uh, thank you, Trevor, for being here. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think so many people out there listening, and this is going to be a great episode for, I think, those, for those individuals that come up with a great idea, and they're like, I want to sell this to the masses, but they probably don't take action. So this is great having actually an inventor uh, on this podcast today. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Excited. I'm glad we were able to make this work. Uh, so yeah, I mean, can you walk us through what is the the Williams key? Sure. So Trevor Williams made the Williams key. I can show you an example here. This is what it looks like. It's a very simple piece of metal for bypassing locks. It, um, for people listening, it's uh, kind of an L. It looks like an L, like a metal L. L shape. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a firefighter in the Los Angeles area, and I used to be a door contractor, so I installed a lot of doors and locks and took pride in that work and then was devastated when I became a firefighter and started destroying doors. And it, it hurt me because I knew how much each of these doors cost and what it would how it would affect a business owner or a homeowner. Um, so, yeah, the, the way the Williams key works um, is there's there's a blade for those listening. And that blade will slip behind the strike of the lock and and slide it open. So a strike is the same as a throw or um, a latch on a on a simple lock. So um, it won't um, it won't mess with deadbolts. So if you're worried about your security at home, as long as you have a deadbolt, you should be okay. And if first responders need to get in, they're gonna probably break your door. But that's okay as long as you're safe in the meantime. So that's how it works. All right. Well, this is great. I mean, let's rewind to, I guess, a, a young Trevor. Was young Trevor, I know you talked about it. You did door installations and firefighting. But before that, growing up, were you built? Were you an inventor? Were you building stuff on the side? Or who was a young Trevor? Uh, young Trevor was probably creative. Um, not inventing things per se, but... I grew up as a missionary, so I lived in Africa uh, beginning at four years old and stayed there with my parents who were missionaries. My dad worked for World Vision, which is a large international organization doing emergency relief work. And uh, we lived in a country called Zaire, which is now the DRC or Democratic Republic of Congo. And it was during a uh, war zone during a time of war where there was a lot of civil unrest. If you've seen Hotel Rwanda, we were there during that time. Rwanda bordered Zaire, so we were affected by that. And eventually I had to move to South Africa. And we took refuge in South Africa, which is basically a, a first world country inside of a third world country. So it's supposedly more safe, but uh, we found that not to be the case and there's still a lot of crime um so eventually we evacuated out of africa altogether and uh took uh took refuge in the states on the east coast in connecticut uh i was there for a few years and then we ended up moving to haiti hmm. haiti if you haven't heard of it is an island in the caribbean attached to the dominican republic and together they make up the island of hispaniola it's about 500 miles south of Florida, and it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So we were there doing the same thing, working for the same organization. And it was like being in Africa, but a lot more condensed. So you were, you were being affected even more. It seemed, at least, uh, more impoverished and more, more dangerous to, <laughs> as well. So what I mean, how old were you when you made it to Haiti? I was 12. I was 12 years old. I was finishing middle school and then I went into high school there. There was an international um, English speaking school that I that I attended while I was there. 
so growing up right in in africa and then you said connecticut right yes connecticut so how long were you in connecticut for connecticut four or five years somewhere okay. there, from eight to twelve so you were there for a couple of years i mean some probably earlier memories are probably that that connecticut but you still probably felt of africa i mean what's the mindset of going to this is a third world country then going to the u.s and then back to kind of a, a third world country i mean was it what was me was it i'm just happy to be here with my family i mean what was the mindset growing up do you remember oh i remember <laughs> um <laughs> i it was devastating for me leaving connecticut um where everything was happy and good and you could go to the movie theaters and get a cheeseburger get a slushie at 7-eleven to a country where there was none of that and i was fearful for my life on a daily basis um it was that was very tough especially at the age of 12 where you're getting established with your friends um i had a good network with my church and with my neighborhood and my school and I, it was very hard to leave that behind um i wouldn't have done it any other way looking back um it helped build me into who i am today and living in countries like that force you to grow up a little bit faster as you're dealing with things we might not deal with here in america um but out there it's it's every day is a you know, it make, makes or breaks you, it's survival. Um, so I had to look at things a little bit differently. What happens after Haiti? Okay, so same same thing that happened with Africa, Haiti got too dangerous and we had to evacuate out of Haiti. There's civil unrest, the government was being overthrown, uh, the president left. So we moved to California, where I am to this day and uh, my dad was able to relocate there for a few years. I started pursuing firefighting as a 15 year old. So firefighting kind of fell along the same lines of being a missionary and helping people. It just came very naturally to me that I would continue doing that sort of work because that's all I ever knew growing up and I enjoyed it. It was very re rewarding. So I got into something called an explorer program where they teach you how to be a firefighter as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And you get to do all the training with the fire departments. And eventually, once you've done enough training, they let you spend the night and go on ride alongs and see if firefighting is really for you or not. Once you, once you see the first blood and guts, you know, you, you know pretty quick if it's something you want to be involved with or not. What do you, what do you think? Uh, drew you to firefighting was it was it building roots to s make sure you stayed in california or was it simply just i want to help back and this is the avenue i could probably go forward with uh, building roots wasn't a concern i i applied for 60 different fire departments all over the u.s i flew around it was extremely competitive during the time i was trying to get hired uh, spent seven years trying to get hired oh, wow. and uh, I, I think what kept me in firefighting and in California was um, I, I just loved it. A anytime I moved, that was my home and I, I had to commit to that being my home because I never knew what you know the next month would bring if, if we're moving again but you can't live your whole life being like well i'm not going to be here very long so i don't want to make any friends um whenever i moved somewhere that was my roots and uh, until further notice so yeah. i got uh, established as quickly as possible and yeah i just love the physical aspect of it i i've always enjoyed fitness and uh what firefighting involves for that is very very physical we're working out every day you have to stay fit and you're around like-minded people who are highly motivated um stay in shape worked hard to get the job um yeah i think that's what really drew me to it <clears throat> your fire your fire firefighter now right and then do you go back on a side gig installing doors or did you take a break or where did the installing doors come from aha uh -huh. good question so when I was 
18, my family left uh, left California and moved back to Haiti, and I was old enough to live on my own. So I decided to stay in California. This was before I got hired, okay. and I had to pay the bills. So I, I got involved with a construction company, and it was finished carpentry, installing doors. And we worked on a lot of big colleges, police departments, fire departments, other types of schools, doing big car, big contracts and putting in sometimes a hundred doors a day. Um, but you'd put in like, one, you know, today we're just doing hinges. So you do 300 hinges. And then the next day you'd come back and we're doing the people and then do 300 of those. So I did that for a couple of years and that's where I developed, I think more of a work ethic because I was independent, I was on my own. And I knew I wanted to be a firefighter really badly though. So I treated it as if I were a firefighter. I would throw the construction ladder the same way I would throw a firefighter ladder. I'd lay out my extension cord the way I'd lay out a fire hose. And um, I was still testing, I was traveling around, testing everywhere, doing interviews, practicing, meeting with other guys who wanted to get hired. And that's, uh, that's how I got my feet wet in, in the work world and I'd highly recommend anybody uh, who doesn't know what they want to do pick up a trade because you're gonna get to know tools you get gonna get to use your hands and um, those are skills that will follow you around the rest of your life and I know for me I, I use my construction construction skills every day as a firefighter as we manipulate doors and as we read building construction during a fire knowing what's underneath you and you're on the roof of a fire. So good skills to have. Where does the idea of the Williams key come about or just like the, yeah, where does that idea come from? So I made the Williams key for myself along with a bunch of other tools. And I, I had this little bag, I call it my wizard bag. And it's, I know how to pick locks. I know how to do some more technical advanced skills, but there was also some tools in there that, the everyday firefighter could use that they would see me using every day on call. So some of some of the tools would open a panic hardware really easily, or some would open an elevator. Um, but the Williams key, which I just made one for myself, was the tool that everybody saw me grabbing the most frequently. And before long, everybody wanted one. And it's hard to fabricate tools you know, just out of the blue. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to do it. Uh, and then eventually I made a, a small batch for my colleagues, my friends, handed them out. And I work at a big station in West Hollywood and um, there's 39 of us on all the shifts. So a lot of people come through that station and, and get to meet me and I meet new people and we see each other work and we're, we're always learning from each other. So before long, this tool spread around the county that I work for. We have almost 200 stations, so guys would come and go. And yeah, before long, people were like, hey, I'll, I'll pay you. Please make me one. So I started making small batches, 100 at first, then 500. And I think the, the largest batch I've done has been 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, sold about 12,000 at this point. And there hasn't been a day that's gone by since I started selling them that I haven't gotten orders in. So they, they've been very popular, very successful. And now, you know, FBI and DOJ and Homeland and SWAT and Navy SEALs, all these different organizations are contacting me, asking for orders. So it's very cool to see how this is developed out of nowhere because I, I never intended on starting a business, but it's the, the cards I was dealt. So I'm trying to ride the wave and keep up with it. And I'm finally to a point where I'm like, okay, I think I, I think I see how this goes, but it's constantly changing and, and growing and it's fun. I enjoy it. I think there's probably a, probably a lot of people or a decent amount of people that are listening they go, if I have this idea, right, I'm going to come from scarcity and say, I don't want to give it to someone else because someone else is going to copy. What do I have? But it really sounds like you went from abundance of like, I'm just going to help people out you know, and 
whatever happens happens i mean was there a point where you actually says i have to protect myself i have to have a protect kind of my business my my side my side hustle my company uh no because initially i just wanted to help people and yeah. I, that's still what i believe um you know people who can't afford to buy one make one you know it's it's mm -hmm. a piece of metal cut it um and then some people now i get comments all day long on all the social media platforms like oh i'm just gonna make it or you know that's stupid it's just a piece of metal <laughs> or whatever and that's fine like i'm i'm just here to help people make faster saves and get get in you know when time is of the essence and seconds count um so i don't care about making money uh i do work very hard now this has become uh very time consuming um with uh also having a full-time firefighter job um i don't have much time to myself anymore so i don't there and there's people who do try and copy it and and all that stuff and i don't care they're like the market's huge um i know that i'm making a difference when it comes to um people who will utilize the tool in a good way and uh that's that's really all that matters to me right now where do you think the the change happened from being a inventor to being a business owner kind of come about for you in in this company hmm i that's a great question i i haven't thought that one through probably when i had to like file all the s corp paperwork and oh, yeah. get legitimate um that's when i really started to become more real and I have to answer to government entities um or when like you know the military will contact me and need like specific forms with my EIN number and um that was all new to me so now I know I'm on the radar of a lot of people and I think um that's one aspect of it the other aspect is I started to get recognized like from people I'd never met so, oh, you're, like at a restaurant. Oh, are, are you the Williams Key guy? <laughs> um, so it just kind of blew my mind. You know, I'm just uh, just a simple guy. Um, but now the, the, there's videos on TikTok with millions of views. Same with Instagram. Um, it's really taken off, even internationally. Um, I've got a map on my wall in my office here with little pinpoints of all the sales. And there's like probably 20 different international companies that I've sold to. Um, so, yeah. Where, where do you, where do you see yourself and your business going to the future? Um, I would like to keep it. I know there's, as, as you get more popular and create more money, sometimes people will try and buy you out. Bigger companies might try and buy you out. Um, I have a, price but it's very high because i i don't want to sell it um my name's on it it's i'm the face of it it's um something i would do for free um if i if i could i guess um so money's not really uh the biggest issue um but as far as growth goes um i just met with somebody recently to discuss business plans um like creating that one year, three year, five year out type of type of goal, type of plan. So I'm starting to throw those ideas around. But ultimately, I'd like to be in more brick and mortar locations. Um, I haven't pursued that. I have one right now that's local here in Los Angeles that sells the keys. I've got about nine online distributors, so a lot more online, but having products in stores where people can touch it and look at it and feel it um i'd like to have a lot more of that as well as it's better for sales because they'll have to hold inventory so if they start running low they'll have to purchase more versus a online distributor um, a lot of those are drop ship so they don't need to hold any inventory they can just advertise my tool on their company they get a cut when they make a sale but i ship it so no risk to them but uh that's that's probably one of the biggest things. Um, I've continued to make more products. So anybody that wants to visit williamskey.com, there's about 
10 other projects I've made or collaborated with. And um, they're all kind of along the same lines of uh, firefighting and first responding. And um, like, for example, this is a, a door hanger I came up with that once you make entry into a building or somebody's house and they're not home, um, you might have knocked over a plan or like bent their screen or something. And when they come home, they're going to think they got robbed because mm. the house is disturbed and they don't know why. And there could have been no fire. We could have gone in the wrong building. You know, we, there's a lot of different scenarios out there. But so now um, fire departments, police uh, are carrying this and they'll just hang it on the door and they can write a little note at the bottom saying, hey, sorry, we, we broke your pot. Um, you didn't get robbed, though. It's just a routine, you know, check your, your smoke alarm is going off or something. So um, I'm always coming up with like little. Does little that happen ideas. a lot? Oh, yeah. Oh wow! <laughs> All the time. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. it for us, uh, we're constantly going. In, we're, I mean, we're busy, but we're constantly going into buildings and residents where nobody's home. And maybe we climbed in the the window with a ladder, or maybe we got in with one of my tools. And most of the time, we don't do damage um, as long as you have a Williams key. But um, if we did do damage, the, the people got to know they didn't get robbed. It's, that's kind of unnerving, right? You come home and you're your doorknob is snapped off or something like you you want to know why and then you'd be on high alert unless you unless you saw one of these on your front door and you're like oh, okay i got a visit from first responders do you think there would ever be a time where you would find enjoyment simply in just inventing items uh well i, I don't think i would have to slow down to do mm. that although I, ideas do come to me when i'm like working less like i go on vacation that so we, me and my wife just had a baby we did a baby moon to dubai on the plane is when i came up with this because i'm like oh, i'm on i'm on vacation i can finally like let my mind rest and then my mind's like no nope, you're not resting i got an idea for you so i think if i had a little bit more r and r and and time to think uh more ideas would come obviously with each idea you need money to back it up so once the Williams key came along, it started providing some money for some other ideas that I can take a risk on. Um, every idea is at least a couple of thousand dollars to get some prototypes made and um, marketing or, or whatnot. So uh, yeah, I, I definitely see myself continuing to make things in the future if I had time to just do that. Uh, I might drive myself crazy, but I, I like the balance and I think putting myself, putting myself in situations where there's a problem that I need to solve, which is what firefighters do all the time. We're problem solvers, critical thinkers. Um, that's what spawns new ideas. Like, how can I do this better? What can I create that would make this faster? Um, ha I have a four month old newborn girl our first kid so with her around now i'm thinking about like dad ideas and like baby ideas and um you know a whole different way of thinking for me as a parent now um is how can i help make parenting easier um so i think yeah i think i'll always have the wheels turning and a list of ideas and yeah you, you take a risk you throw you throw darts at the board and maybe one or two sticks the other fall off and hey those are my my big hitters those are successful so i just yeah keep taking the risk you know what have you learned because i mean when you started the williams key it was kind of organic growth right over time you're just making it for friends and kind of silly mm -hmm. have is there any advice you would give your younger self that person that just started with the williams key to be more inclined to to grow faster than than your trajectory in the past? Um, make a TikTok earlier. <laughs> TikTok <laughs> is something that I was kind of against for a while. Yeah. And I only recently made one mm, maybe a year ago. I think it was less than a year ago. And that thing has grown so quickly. And their algorithms must be different because videos on there go viral so fast. 
And that has my most following now where I've put the most time and effort into the Instagram. But yeah, I've got probably four or five videos with multi-million views on there. And that directly impacts the sales. Um, I, anytime I start seeing the sales go up, I'm like, oh man, the video must be going off right now. So <laughs> I want to one at first because sometimes it's random, but I'll start going through all my social media platforms and um, it'll be the craziest stuff that sets it off. And I, everybody wants to know the algorithm and I think it's like constantly changing. But what I've noticed is it's the comments people start commenting on your video and it's usually stupid stuff like that door's not really locked he didn't check it to make sure the door was locked before he did the demo with the key um or what this one i i don't know it's just the so now when i'm making a video on to like to market to that, I'm like, should I do something wrong so that people start commenting on this and tell me how to do it right and argue about it? Like, should I provoke people? I don't know. Um, Makes sense. So it, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's something I never thought would be how it how it works. Um, but like, do I want to be tricking people into commenting and and watching the videos? I don't know. I'm I'm still I'm still learning from that. But the other advice that I would give myself is um, take risk, talk to as many people as possible, network, um, be humble, listen to people. Um, just always keep the door open. That's and that's a good metaphor for my tool. But um, <laughs> always keep the door open as far as like, hey, you want to come to this uh, get together? I, you know, I have some business friends coming over or whatever. Never say no to that stuff. You never know who you're going to meet, who's going to like you or be interested in your tool or want to be an investor or have some good insight for you. Well, thank you so much for, for being on the Road Truth podcast today. If someone's listening right now and they're looking to get more information about the, the Williams Key or just kind of watch your TikToks and, and comment on it, what's the best way of them staying up to date on uh, what the Williams Keys have or Williams Key has? I would say um, the Instagram is at the Williams Key. I am most active on there. I try and reach my uh, my followers through the stories and through posts. So anything new that comes out, it'll be on there first. And then, uh, yeah, the, the website, you can sign up for the newsletter, follow the TikTok. Uh, Facebook, all that stuff. But I would say Instagram is where I'm most active. And then you can DM me. I think we might have lost them. And that was definitely interesting. So in the show notes, you're going to find all of Trevor's information. But that's how it happens. It goes really quick like that with technology. And he's back right there. Okay, well, Trevor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, you're fine. No, it, it was like right at the end of it. But all that, all Trevor's information is in the show notes. You can go in the show notes and get the information. I'm going to finish on one last question while we have Trevor here. If someone's listening right now and they basically have an invention that they really think is worthwhile, what's one thing that they should do today or this week to kind of move forward, move the needle forward on kind of getting their invention out there? Yeah, so reach out to me. Um, you can do it through email, the Williams key at gmail.com or send me a DM on Instagram. We can talk, but I've, I've been helping develop a company called Medfire that has gotten the Williams key to where it is today. Um, as far as de developing the product, going through prototypes and getting it on the market. So if you're interested in, you have an idea and you, you want to ask me if it's a good idea or not, I, I might not know, but I can help you um get it in front of the right people and um see if it does well oh well, then again thank you trevor for for being here hopefully everyone listening got some great nuggets for that i know you're probably listening oh my gosh i had this idea oh five years ago a year ago or maybe it was yesterday you had this idea but what's holding you back take a chance come from abundance give back reach out to trevor i mean how hard is it to basically send a direct message send an email Hey, he's willing to allow you to bounce the idea and see if he can help you out. I mean, if you listen to a story, he's all about coming from abundance. 
giving back, giving to the world. And maybe it can help you grow just like he's grown. Thank you guys for listening. Please subscribe. Please share and go find Trevor. Bye, everyone.